Good morning. I'm Dr. Luis Adiel Medrano Danes, currently a first year neuroradiology trainee at the Medical Imaging Department of the University Hospital, Dr. Jose Lutero Gonzalez. And today I'm going to show you this case. Uh, this is a 36 year old female patient who started four years ago with a left retroauricular slow growing mass and bilateral progressive visual loss. Three years after, uh, a left temporal parietal craniectomy was performed to resect the tumor, and the histopathological diagnosis was osteosarcoma. Three, month, three months uh, after the surgery, the patient came to our hospital by first time to a rapid growth of the mass of the surgical site here, which presents skin ulcerations and infectious changes, as well as left facial hemiparesis and hearing loss in the same site. A, contra a contrast enhanced MR was performed, being this the only image study performed in our hospital, and we didn't have access to her previous image studies. Okay, here we have some actual and kernel MR images, and uh, we can see the left temporal occipital parietal craniectomy with transcalvarian herniation of the extraaxial lesion which has intracranial and extracranial extensions and also a cervical extension. Uh, it's heterogeneous on T2 and T1 images. And here in T1, we can see some hyperintense zones that may suggest hemorrhage. Um, and there is restriction on diffusion weighted images, as you see here. And with that, uh, 0 0.7 uh, ADC values in the more in the in the zones with more restriction. On susceptibility weighted and geography technique, there are uh, increased magnetic susceptibility areas that confirms hemorrhage. We see in different cuts. After gadolinium administration, we can see heterogeneous enhancement with high point, some hypointense zones that suggest necrosis. This is the simple T1, and this is a, a contrast enhanced T2, T2, T1. On perfusion weighted imaging with dynamic susceptibility contrast technique, a relative uh, cere uh, cerebral blood volume increases more than 10 times, as you see here, compared with the contralateral cerebellar and, and brain parenchyma, apparently normal. We can see invasion to the dura and the subdural space, and also extension towards the brain and cerebellar parenchyma in this coronal image. There is involvement of the transverse and sigmoid sinus and also a jugular, uh, the left jugular vein uh, has a dilation and partial thrombosis. This is a coronal image, and we can compare with the contralateral jugular vein. It is dilated and has a, the thrombus here. The lesion presents angiogenesis characterized by multiple dilated and tortuous and vascular structures uh, in the adjacent cerebral and cerebellar parenchyma. There is destruction of the tympanic, the petros, and mastoid process of the left temporal bone, and also the left temporal mandibular joint is of, uh, involved here. And we uh, couldn't see the geniculate ganglion and all the facial nerve in all their segments. As I said before, uh, this is the only image study we have of this case. However, I consider it interesting uh, due to the findings. It will have been helpful to have had performed a CT scan to study the effects of the adjacent bone structures. So we're going to make a, a review of this case. Um, osteosarcoma is the primary malignant bone tumor composed by sarcomatose spindle cells with excessive production of osteoid matrix. Constitutes the 20% of all the primary malignant bone tumors, but only less than 1% affects the cranial bout. About fewer than 98 cases have been reported. It's more frequent in the third and fourth decade of life with a peak during the third decade with higher prevalence in males. There is a higher incidence in Paget disease associated osteosarcomas than of primary osteosarcomas on the cranial bout. 
And other risk entities are fibrosis, dysplasia, multiple oste osteochondromatosis, chronic osteomyelitis, myositis ossificans, and also trauma. Depending on the predominant elements of the matrix, be it osteoid, cartilage, or fibrous tissue, it can be classified as osteoblastic, at the half of the cases, chondroblastic, and fibroblastic. And based on the degree of the cellular atypia and the gradient of osteosarcoma can be classified as low, intermediate, or high-grade. Invasion of the adjacent soft tissue is considerable in high-grade uh, surface osteosarcoma. About the symptoms, it may include slow growing mass or swelling, headache, cranial nerve palsies as our patient, uh, exophthalmos, visual impairment, cranial hypertension, depending on the affected structures. The CT scan will, uh, with bone window, plays the key role of diagnosis, and the contrast enhanced MR is use, useful to assess the uh, soft tissue involvement. The findings on CT may, may be uh, osteolytic and osteosclerotic features, as we see in this image. Sometimes ill-defined borders. Radiating striations may be seen, as this example. And periosteal reaction as Godman's triangle, as we see here, here in this image. And the findings on MR images include T2 heterogeneous mass, uh, maybe uh, necrosis or hemorrhage, and T1 postgadolinium, there is uh, a homogeneous to heterogeneous enhancement with invasion of the dura and subdural space, as we saw in our patient in this example. The diagnosis is made by biopsy, and the treatment includes two to three steps. Uh, the first step is neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which decreases the tumor size and, and enables better chance of total surgical removal. The second step is the surgical resection and to get negative margins of neoplasia. And the third step is only uh, if, our, if our sentient resection is achieved is uh, adjuvant radiotherapy. This increases five year survival rates when tumor is localized in 20 to 60% of the cases. The local recurrence is the main reason of treatment failure and decreases the five year survival rates. Uh, here is the table that shows the main difference between the sarcomatosis school neoplasia and the two differential diagnoses, the osseous meningioma and hemangiopericytoma. And we, we, you can see uh, there is uh, very similar features between the, the sarcomatosis school tumor and hemangiopericytoma than osseous, osseous uh, meningioma. Uh, the, one of the difference is the, of the presentation is the decade or age of presentation. That is the third decade as uh, sarcomatosis school tumor and fourth decade in hemangiopericytoma. And that's it, and thank you for your attention. Good morning. My name is Azalea garza Baez and I am a second year neuroradiology uh, resident. So today, uh, the case I'm going to discuss is of neuroradiology. So the clinical case is a 29-year-old female with recent diagnosis of adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma, which is known as ATLL, in March 2019 because she had four months with cervical adenopathy and hyperleukocytosis. So uh, was performed um, CT, an enhanced CT of the neck, the thorax, and of the abdomen, where you can see practically all over the body and large lymph nodes in all the levels of the cervical area. Bilateral, you can see all these little 
well, large uh, lymph nodes. Also, you can see in the supraclavicular area, and also you can see in the axillary area. Besides, we can see also some of the lymph nodes which have used in the mediastinum. And in this image, this coronal image of the thoracic and abdominal, we can see uh, another view of the axillary lymph nodes. You can see how there is like a uh, large lymph nodes uh, fused in the mediastinum. Besides, we can see here in the retroperitoneum some enlarged lymph nodes too. In images I haven't shown, I, uh, because these are the most representative, there are also pelvic lymph nodes and also inguinal enlarged lymph nodes. Besides, another interesting thing is that uh, she had infiltration of her right breast. So, because all of these findings, a biopsy was done of one of the cervical adenopathy and the uh, diagnosis of ATLL was done. So, the treatment for ATLL or leukemia lymphoma of CTL is with the GMO protocol. The GMO protocol is a German protocol where, where there are different kinds of chemotherapy agents used. And Immediately, uh, she started with the induction phase where the chemotherapy agents used were prednisone, vancristine, L-asperginase, and metosontrone. Besides, also intrathecal chemotherapy was applied. After a month of she receiving this uh, induction phase therapy, she started in May 2019 with generalized weakness, left-sided amyparesis, and generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So because of this, a head CT was done. Here are the most representative images of the study. The first image is in actual, where the most important um, finding is, if you can see here, in the most rostral part of the superior sagittal sinus, you can see that it's hyperdense if you compare it with the most caudal part of it. Also, you can see here a cortical vein which is hyperdense. This is not normal, okay? In this corona, you can see again how is the superior sagittal sinus hyperdense. In this sagittal view, you can see how most of the rostral and dorsal part of the superior sagittal sinus is hyperdense, and the posterior part is normal. In this corona, you can see that the posterior part of the superior sagittal sinus is normal. So when you see the superior sagittal sinus hyperdense, also known as the dense clot sign, this is compatible with thrombosis. Two days later, uh, the patient got worse, okay? So another CT was done, and we can see, this is a similar image of the previous study, the same finding, you know, the superior sagittal sinus thrombosis with the cortical vein. But also, you can see small areas, hyperdense areas of hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space, in this uh, right side. And also in this coronal, you can see there's subarachnoid hemorrhage in the right and left side. Besides, in the superior uh, frontal gyrus, the right one, you can see there's hypertense area compatible with edema. And also hyperdense fossae in, in, another, in other images too, in the superior and middle frontal gyrus, you can see these are macrohemorrhages. So at this point, we have a patient with a thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus and also hemorrhage and edema of the frontal lobe the right frontal lobe. At this point, after two CTs, a uh, decision was made to suspend the chemotherapy. So uh, it was expected that the patient get better with time, but it didn't happen. She started with altered mental status, so a contrast enhanced MR of the brain was uh, done because uh, they had suspicion of infiltration of leukemia to the brain. So we have these uh, representative images of the uh, brain MRI. The first one is a T1 sequence, T2, flare, enhanced T1, susceptibility weight image, and diffusion. And where you can see in the first image is, first of all, the cortical vein we have seen on the CT, hyperdense. Here is hyperintense. Also, we can see that in both superior and middle frontal gyrus, we see edema. In the T2 image, we see the edema, and also small fossa, hyperintense foci compatible with microhemorrhage we have already seen uh, uh, on the CT. On this flare image, we see again a hyperintense cortical vein, with, which is thrombose, and also we see edema in the small fossa of hemorrhage. 
In the enhanced uh, T1 enhanced image, we see that there is not a normality, there's nothing enhancing, nor leptomeningeal enhancement or dural or any um, nodule con enhancement. In the susceptibility grade image, we can see better the MRH, which is of greater magnitude than the previous CT. We see cortical MRH, subcortical MRH, and well, also the subarachnoid MRH. And an interesting thing is that here in the diffusion image, you can see the hyperintense cortical vein. So another, I'm just reassuring that the cortical vein was thrombosed. Other interesting thing is that you can see that the superior sagittal sinus has uh, in the normal intensity. Ice intensity one, hyperintensity two, with no um, defect on the contrast enhancement image because uh, uh, because the, the chemotherapy was suspended, the sinus was recanalized. These are other images of susceptibility weighted, weighted image in actuals and in sagittal. We can, we can see better the hemorrhage. We can see there are other areas of hemorrhage, of micro hemorrhage, supratentorial, and infratentorial, okay? Also, we can see this coronal T2 image. We can see better the uh, edema of the both uh, frontal lobes. And this is another image in the level of the basal ganglia, a T1 enhanced, where we can show again, there's no abnormal enhancement. So this patient doesn't have infiltration of leukemia or lymphoma. So at this point, uh, what we can conclude with these images? Well, we don't have evidence of infiltration of leukemia or lymphoma. But yes, we have a complication of the chemotherapy, which is superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, the cortical vein thrombosis, and you have to remember that when there is a thrombosis of a, uh, a structure, like the sinus, uh, there's increase the, well, there is an elevated um, a pressure in the sinus, and this can lead to edema of the brain and hemorrhage, okay? So, I'm gonna take a, a brief review of uh, cancer treatment induced neurotoxicity. So chemotherapy and radiotherapy can have important effect in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. And this can limit the course of the treatment. Which are the factors that can lead us to these complications? Well, first of all, we have to consider the dose of the treatment. Another important thing is the route of administration. The most dangerous route is the intratecal. Also, you can, uh, we have to consider interaction with other agents. Also, if the patient already has structural alterations in the white matter, and also individual patient vulnerability. So, treatment toxicity can occur by two mechanisms. One is a direct uh, damage to the neurons or to the glia, and the other one is indirectly by altering the surrounding uh, microenvironment, like damaging the vessels. Recognition of the neurological adverse effect is very important because if we can identify this, we can change the dose of the chemotherapy or even suspend it because if we do not do this, the, the damage will be worse. So we have here two tables of the complications we can see on the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system because of chemotherapy agents. The most common ones are headache, seizures, acute or chronic encephalopathy, press, cerebrovascular disease, like the case of our patient, and others. And also we have, consider, we have to consider that there's also complications in the peripheral nervous system, like fluxopathy, um, neuromuscular junction defects, or even peripheral neuropathy. Here are some tables uh, just to show you that we already know, or in the literature, the direct uh, complications of certain chemotherapeutic agents. We can see that l s can cause headache, seizures, and even encephalopathy. And also, uh, we have to remember that our patient, uh, l s was part of her treatment. And also, vincristine is associated with seizures and, and also with um, encephalopathy. And no matter what, which drug is applied, Intratecal chemotherapy can, be, can give any complications like seizures, encephalopathy, um, plexopathy, etc. 
And these are another table where we can see that um, vincristine, which also was also one of the chemotherapeutic agents used in our patient, is associated with cranial palsies like extracular palsy, ptosis, facial weakness, hearing loss, etc. If the chemotherapy agent is suspended in a certain time, these changes could be reversible. But if we wait like weeks, then the damage would be irreversible. So what about the cerebrovascular disease? Well, patients that have cancer have a hypercoagulated state. So just because you have cancer, you can have a stroke. But if you add as well these treatments, these chemotherapy agents, then uh, the percentage of complications get higher. So which are the chemotherapy agents that increase the risk of stroke? Well, allosporogenase, cyclosporine, doxorubicin, estramustine, methotrexate, platinum-based treatments. But we have to remember ls progenase not only increases the rate of arterial thrombosis, but also of venous sinus thrombosis, which can lead to stroke, hemorrhage, and seizures. This is another example of the literature where you can see a patient wh who which had a leukemia and was treated with the same protocol, induction phase with GMO, and in the temporal right region, we can see in this T1 image, hyperintense signal comparable with subacute hemorrhage. In these two, two we can see areas of hemorrhage, which, which see here hyperintense, and also edema that affects the gray and white matter. The flare, you see the same findings. And on the diffusion image, you can see there's areas of restriction uh, uh, with the same thing in the ADC. And in this venography of MRI, we can see that the tra uh, transfer right sinus is thrombosed, and also the segment sinus is partially thrombosed. So in this patient, she had, a, which was also a female, had a thrombosis of the transverse and segment sinus, and eventually she got a stroke and hemorrhage as a complication of the chemotherapy. So what we can conclude is that it is very important that we know the toxicities, so we can we, so we can be able to differentiate between treatment-related symptoms from progression of cancer. If we are not uh, aware of the complications, it will be very difficult for us to differentiate this. And we have, to, we have to remember that a patient with infiltration of leukemia or lymphoma has a prognosis very different from a complication of chemotherapy. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Good morning, my name is Daira Gutierrez. I am in a fellowship of breast image, and my interesting case is a 68-year-old male with a history of hereditary breast cancer with a palpable nodule in the right breast of eight days of evolution. In mammography, OML is identified by right retroregular, irregular nodule with a microlobule margin, hyperdense, 30 by 24 millimeters, and the left retroreolar, a little circumscribed nodule, hyperdense, 10 for 5 millimeters. For ultrasound, was observed in the right breast retroreolar, irregular nodule of indistinct margins, hypochoic with internal linear echogenic bands of 26 by 22 by 21 millimeters and without flow to the color doppler examination, predominantly hard bioelastography. And the left breast retroreolar oval null microlobulate margins hypoechoic of nine by six by five millimeters. Without flow to the color doppler examination and with intermediately patterned by elastography. And lymph node of mass appearance in the right axillary regions, 
18 by 17 by 8 millimeters, which requires to pathological correlation. They were biopsy of right breast, left breast, and right axillary lymph node. And the outcome in right breast is ductal carcinoma with nuclear grade three infiltrating and micropapular pattern and present lymphatic vascular invasion. Left breast, ductal carcinoma with nuclear grade three infiltrating and right axillary lymph node metastatic carcinoma. So we are bilateral synchronous male breast cancer. Breast cancer is rare in men and accounts for 1% of all breast cancer. A bilateral synchronous presentation is extremely rare with, a, with an incidence of 1.5% of total number of patients with breast cancer. Bilateral breast cancer is defined as the presence of an independent primary malignant tumor in each mammary gland. The term synchronous refers to the presence of primary tumor in both breasts, which are diagnosed simultaneously. Most cases of male breast cancer are detected between 60 and 70 years old with a mean age of 67 years, which is older than the mean age of females. The risk factors for male breast cancer include familial and genetic factors, radiation exposure, Klinefelter syndrome, hormonal imbalance, obesity, and testicular disease. Although breast cancer in male presents in a similar way to that of females, there is limited data regarding treatment of male breast cancer, and most treatment recommendations are extrapolated from during women. Male breast cancer tends to be diagnosed at an older age, and at the more advanced stage of female breast cancer, the overall survival rate is low in males. Prognosis of male breast cancer remains uncertain because of the late diagnosis on predictable course and high potential for metastasis. The mainstays of treatment is based on local and regional control of the disease with surgery. The prognosis does not seem to be poor compared with females when age and stage are matched. The importance of this case report is that to create more awareness that breast cancer can occur in males just like females, although it's rare in males. A painless lump, blurry nipple discharge, or retraction in males, especially an elderly age, requires the revelation and confirmation of cancer. Complaints with treatment modalities is necessary to ensure good outcomes. In conclusion, breast cancer is rare in males and extremely rare is bilateral synchronic breast cancer. Early presentation and compliance with treatment programs will help reduce the, in the incidence of tumor recurrence and provide better prognosis for the patients. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Cynthia Guillén Gutierrez. I'm a fourth year resident, and today we're going to review an obstetric case. We have a 17 year old female, and, and she uh, has a pregnancy that it's uh, 31 weeks of gestation, and she had no relevant history. Within the normal evaluation of the fetus, we observe the brain uh, within normal mor morphological characteristics, including the structures of the midline, uh, lateral ventricles, uh, 
we also see the thalami and cerebellum and also another structures of the uh, posterior fossa. All of these structures until this moment are apparently normal. And then we start to uh, assess the heart. One of the first images that we are looking for in the cardiac evaluation is one that is called for chambers view. Here we can uh, assess the right uh, atrium, the left atrium, the forearm oval, the uh, left, uh, the left ventricle, and the right ventricle. In our patient, we see a septum uh, defect in the interventricular septum. And another uh, things that we assess in the heart uh, counts for the valvular pulmonary, which in our patient was uh, was normal. We can see in this image uh, the out the outflow of the ventricular of the pulmonary artery that ari is arising from the, the right ventricle. And another image we need to assess in the in the cardiac evaluation is uh, the one that it's called three vessel view, which normally we can assess the superior vena cava, the aortic arch, and the pulmonary artery. In our patient, we only uh, observe the superior vena cava and the uh, aortic, aortic arch. And we also get, uh, see in this part the trachea. So uh, I want you uh, to look to a normal heart first. We have here the four chamber view. We can assess the ventricular uh, the interventricular septum, which is complete in this case. And also, uh, in a higher levels, we see the outflow tracks. Here, for example, we observe um, the aortic arch, and uh, which is arising from the left ventricle, and from the right ventricle, it's arising the pulmonary artery. However, in our patient, we see here at the fourth chamber view, uh, interventricular septum uh, defect, and above this, we, s we see the orange of the pulmonary artery, which is, I'm gonna pause this. This, um, this is the interventricular defect, and uh, just above it, it's uh, origin the pulmonary artery. If you can follow, this um, is the uh, pulmonary artery. But also, we notice that um, just uh, right and anterior to the origin of the pulmonary artery, we have the origin of the aorta. So, uh, we uh, in the higher levels, we see uh, the three-vessel view, the continuating aortic arch, the superior vena cava, and the trachea. I'm going to um, show you one more time. This is a ventricular septal defect, the pulmonary artery, and then just the right, we see over here, the aorta. Okay, so the rest of the evaluation of the fetus and the surrounding structures such as the placenta, the umbilical cord, uh, the amniotic fluid index and the cervix are observed with normal characteristics. So uh, with this uh, findings, we suggest the double outlet right ventricle, which is a congenital cardiac anomaly where both the aorta and the pulmonary trunk arises from the morphologically right ventricle. It reported uh, account to account for one to two percent of all congenital heart disease. It's uh, a conotruncal anomaly, and uh, there is almost always uh, associated with a ventricular septal defect, uh, like in the case of our, of our patient. The presence of the ventricular septal defect uh, allows the shunting of oxygenated blood to the right ventricle. There is many cl uh, classification, but I think the most important for us is the classification according to where the ventricular septal defect is located. The most common is the subaortic uh, ventricular septal defect, uh, where the defect is located just under the aortic valve. 
In the case of, of, of patients, we uh, located the ventricular septal defect under the pulmonary artery, which is also called tosin bean anomaly. But in another uh, location for the ventricular septal defect, it's uh, affecting both the aortic and pulmonary artery or none of them. On the imaging, uh, it is important to uh, the, prenat the prenatal ultrasound uh, because it's the first mod image modality performed. And this is because it allows the appropriate diagnosis in the fetal life. For example, here we have a four chamber view where we, where we can identify the right ventricle, which is uh, a little bit more uh, larger than the left ventricle. And here we see a little uh, ventricular septal defect. In this another image, in a sagittal view, we see the right ventricle and we see uh, the two outflow tracts arising, uh, both of them, of the right ventricle. Uh, here we can observe the pulmonary artery and the aorta arising just uh, um, anterior to the pulmonary artery. In most cases, the ultrasound is sufficient for the diagnosis and surgical planning. However, when the findings of the initial imaging examination are inconclusive, cardiovascular MRI may play an important role. And this is because uh, we can delimit uh, precisely the anatomy, including the ventricular septal defect, the relationship with the semilunar uh, bulbs, and the outflow tracts. For example, in this patient, we have a uh, MRI, um, a coronal view or uh, MRI, when we can see the outflow tracts of the aorta and the pulmonary artery, all of them arising from the right ventricle. Here we have an ob oblique sagittal image. And we see also uh, um, the ventricular septum defect. It is important to um, look for another associated anomalies, which can uh, be from uh, pulmonary stenosis, uh, outflow obstruction, or anomalies in the mitral valve. The differential diagnosis, uh, one of the most important, including the transposition of great arteries, which is uh, defined by discordant connection between the ventricles and the great arteries. The aorta arises from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle. We can observe here that the great arteries are parallel rather than crossing as they should do. And ultrasound, uh, we observe uh, these uh, two images, uh, we observe the two outflow tracks where observe the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And the right ventricle, uh, ari uh, um, the aorta, I'm sorry, uh, arises from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery from the left ventricle. This is a sagittal view. Uh, we observe that we have a parallel um, track on the both are the aorta and the pulmonary artery. We, in this uh, case, we have also to look for another associated findings, such as a quartation of the aorta. And, and uh, the other important uh, differential diagnosis is the tetalogy of a lot. Uh, which is the most common cyanotic cardiac defect. And the classic tetrad mani manifestation includes uh, the pulmonary outflow tract stenosis or atresia, the ventricular septa defect, the aortic override, or, and the right ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, or in a case of oppression, she didn't have any other an anomalies associated. So uh, the treatment, it's uh, it's planning the timing and the type uh, of the cord surgery depends on the uh, great art artery relationship, the presence and the location of the ventricular septal defect, and on the uh, associated lesions. For this, uh, I think this is an important case because uh, we can assess this pathology since the pr uh, prenatal uh, life. So we can have an appropriate uh, and fitting diagnosis and appropriate, appropriately uh, treatment. Um, so any questions? 
And least but not less, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Raul Martinez Salinas. Thank you for the time I spent with you. I, I learned a lot, and thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is the last uh, case. Uh, my name is Adrián Palomino Salas, and I show you a case uh, of the uh, 73 years old uh, male patient. Uh, it is referred or, or to our service to, to perform a PET-CT study with uh, 18 F FDG. Uh, he has a recent diagnosis of the brain tumor in the left frontal lobe, which was treated uh, by sur surgical resection, uh, but uh, the resection is, uh, was partial. Uh, the histopathological analysis report a metastatic tumor uh, uh, to unknown uh, origin, uh, but uh, suggests uh, 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 DHC trap. Uh, history of uh, the patient has a history with, uh, of the Wharton tumor in the left parotid two years ago uh, that uh, was uh, correlated uh, to histopathological, uh, but uh, this tumor. Uh, um, not correspond to metastatic uh, disease uh, of the patient. <coughs> uh, we have uh, an M M MIP image of the PET CT. Uh, we can see two areas with uh, ingress uptake on the uh, topography of the parotid gland, uh, left parotid gland, and the left upper lobe uh, uh, of the lung. <coughs> and uh, uh, the rest of the match uh, shows a uh, bi uh, normal biodistribution uh, um, to the radio tracer. Um, okay, uh, uh, he <coughs> um, here he uh, had a um, uh, fusion imaging of the brain um, uh, show uh, uh, post surgical changes and uh, uh, we have an uh, increased uptake of the radio tracer and the uh, uh, less of the surgery to, the <coughs> to result a, a residual tumor. Okay. And the CT images, uh, axial and coronal view, uh, shows a uh, mass uh, lobulated uh, with enhancement uh, um, uh, that correspond uh, to the area uh, with increased uptake. And uh, this is a, a um, fusion image to the uh, neck, and it shows um, the Wharton tumor, uh, what I mentioned uh, previously, uh, correspond uh, mass uh, with increased uptake uh, in the left parotid gland. And uh, here in, in the CT images with enhancement, uh, see a um, uh, well circumscript uh, tumor with enhancement and uh, show uh, some areas uh, with uh, uh, cystic degeneration, okay? And uh, the uh, left images uh, shows uh, the increased uptake of the tumor. Uh, now, I uh, 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 had a um, fusion image to the thorax with a long uh, window, and here uh, is the most important uh, finding in this study, okay? Uh, Okay. okay, in the left 
upper web of the, uh, uh, we can see uh, a nodule uh, with increased uptake and uh, these images of the CT uh, show the uh, nodule speculated and uh, um, with cavity and increased uh, uptake of the radio tracer. Okay. Uh, uh, a standard uptake value of this nodule was 7.7 uh, .7 and um, with uh, all the features uh, the of this nodule correspond uh, to risk, o risk of malignancy over to no 9%. <coughs> okay, uh, PCT is a combination of the cross-sectional anatom anatomic information provided by CT and the metabolical information uh, provided by uh, PET. Okay, uh, the indications for this study uh, is standing cancer, established baseline, uh, staying before uh, treatment, evaluation of indeterminated lesions, uh, 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 example as uh, SPN, and uh, evaluation uh, to response of therapy, and uh, suspected uh, recurrence disease. Okay, and uh, we can uh, could uh, uh, guide uh, a bio biopsy. <coughs> and uh, PCT uh, is a tool uh, as a problem solving. Uh, uh, um, occult primary relation uh, com uh, okay evaluation to the uh, su suspected recurrence prior to radical uh, uh, nodal resection in patients with meta uh, metastatic melanoma suspected malignancy transformation in the plexiform neurofibroma and differentiated between a radiation in induced necrosis and a recurrence tumor tumor recurrence, okay? Look, no primary tumor is defined uh, as uh, the present of the histologically pr uh, proven metastatic disease without evidence of the primary tumor. Uh, between five and 10% of all uh, cancer patients are diagnosed with uh, cancer of as no uh, primary tumor. Uh, while histopathological analysis frequently provides a uh, hint and a location of the primary site, uh, not all patients' tumor are identified. Uh, FDG per citron emission tomography has been demonstrated uh, to be efficient method to the localized uh, no primary tumor with detection uh, rates uh, to, uh, between uh, 24 uh, and 53 uh, percent. Uh, but the PCT uh, has very special uh, resolution uh, for anatomic location of the deletions that another uh, images studies uh, uh, because uh, uh, are more sensibility and uh, specific. Okay, uh, it's all.